Hello, I'm Simon. And I'm Dan. And this is the Wikicast, a podcast where Wikipedia takes us to a random article each week and we talk about what we find. Dan, what are we talking about this week? This week, Simon, we're talking about the House of Commons Library. Oh my god. We literally what was what did we say just before we started recording this episode? Whatever we do, we won't talk about Brexit. I then hit random article and got the <laughs> House of Commons Library. <laughs> It's one of those cruel infinite universe uh, things where it's like, well, actually, you know what? Oh, God. It's just inescapable. It it is Mm. completely inescapable at the moment. Because uh, for context, the last, as of the day of recording this, last night, um, the House of Commons voted on various Brexit options. And just so the people from outside the UK are clear on where we're currently at, um, MPs voted that they didn't want any kind of Brexit, but they also don't want no Brexit. Yeah. Um, so you would have thought that uh, the other thing, which I can't remember who initially said this, um, the, the the fact that we are doing this indicative vote about what kind of form of us leaving the European Union we're having, you think this would have happened at some point earlier in the past 1,000 days of, of, of this procedure. But there we go. That's that's the UK for you. It's a complete hellscape at the moment. Um, yeah. And then to make to, to, to make things even easier, our glorious leader said that she would, uh, if, if if it makes things easier, she'll step down after something is passed, which is exactly what got us into this fucking mess in the first place. Also, I just love the threat of like, well, if you vote for it, I'll go. Like, yeah, well, like, I know that what you she's doing me. is she's using she's using reverse psychology because we all want her to go, but nobody yeah. wants to vote for it. So she's like, oh, what? she's even managed yeah, to step just down a in a manipulative way. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's incredibly it's... manipulative. Oh god! But there we go. Well, anyway, there we go. We're the not House talking about it. We're not library. talking about it. Yes, the House of Commons Library is the library and information resource for the lower house of the British Parliament, the lower house being Commons and the upper house Lords. So does the um, Lords have its own separate library then, I guess? I'd imagine so. If it's oh. the information resource for the lower house, I guess it, that by logic would dictate that they have another. Um, yeah. It was established in 1818, although its original 1828 construction was destroyed during the burning of Parliament in 1834. Oh, I don't. I mean, obviously, so uh, like the current houses of parliament, I know were a relative built. Yeah, of course they're they're about that period. Yeah, because that was um they were being built when there was like a huge stink in London. Hang on, eighteen thirty four House of Commons, right? House of Parliament. Here we go. Uh, the Great Fire of eighteen thirty four. Um, the Exchequer was faced with the problem of di- disposing of two cartloads of wooden tally. St- Are you kidding me? Mm. To get rid of tally sticks used to record the. <laughs> <laughs> to to record the votes in parliaments they they burn them when asked to burn them the clerk of works the amazing title thought mm. that the two underfloor stoves in the basement of the house of lords would be a safe and proper place to do so and then during the afternoon a party of visitors to the house of lords conducted by the deputy housekeeper mrs wright became puzzled by the heat of the floor and by the smoke seeping through it but the workmen insisted on finishing their job the furnaces were put up by 5 p.m. Uh, Mrs. Wright, no longer worried, locked up the premises. Uh, and at 6 p.m., Mrs. Wright had the terrified wife of a doorkeeper screaming that the House of Lords was on fire. It's literally the Aurora Brilliant. Borealis situation. It's like, what's that? Yeah. What's that smoke coming out of the of the floor and on all this heat? And the workmen are just like, oh, we're just doing our jobs. It's fine. And Mrs. Wright's just like, well, we have nothing to see here, I guess. So that's interesting. So on this same Wikipedia article... If you go to the on the burning of Parliament Wikipedia article, go mm. to the section sixteenth of October eighteen thirty four, and there's a painting by Turner of the burning oh, wow. of the House of Lords. Oh, that's gorgeous! That's really cool. I think Turner's you, my favourite artist. It's my um, dad's favourite artist. Yeah. yeah, I do like it. That's a beautiful one. Yeah. So this is then. So cool. yeah, the the current House of Westminster. The Palace of Westminster, I should say, is was as a result of this fire. I don't know what because I was thinking it was to do with the uh, gunpowder plot, but of course the gunpowder plot didn't actually succeed um, mm. in the 17th century. So, and you know, the buildings don't look like they're from then. Huh? The total. Did, did, I don't know if you saw this. Did you see what the total cost of the building was? Uh, no. Two point five million pounds. Doesn't That's seem quite like- reasonable, I suppose. <laughs> It doesn't seem like very much, does it? Well, it doesn't say if that's accounting for inflation. I imagine 2.5 million at the time is probably a bit more likely. Two point, yeah, I think it must be at the time. 
because otherwise that's cheaper than like a lot of buildings that I've been in at like the university. Yeah. Uh, oh, and there's a mention of our boy John Burko on this Wikipedia page of uh, agreeing that the building is in a, is in need of extensive repairs. <laughs> John Burko's quote here: He reported that the Parliament quote suffers from flooding, contains a great deal of asbestos, and has fire safety issues. Good grief! A fitting a fitting metaphor for the state of our political system. Yeah, and apparently it would cost three billion pounds to fix. Well, there Good we go. Grief. Right. Okay. So tell me more about this. Three billion library. pounds at the time of uh, the early uh, early eighteen hundreds. So with an inflation, <laughs> we're all. Oh my god. <laughs> well, don't worry because we're saving all that money that we're previously sending to the EU. We've, we've you know, that's just like ten weeks worth or something like that. That's fine. We, we, we'll make that money back in no time. Ah. Right. I'm going to hit you with a load of info here. The library itself was established ah! in 1818. Yeah. Sorry. sorry just, just um, hit me with it. Underarm, Dan. Underarm. Uh, and a purpose-designed library was built for it by Sir John Soane, who was an English architect who specialised in the neoclassical style. Hmm. This building, along with much of the medieval Palace of Westminster, to which it was added, was, de- was destroyed in the fire in 1834, which we have discussed. Mm-hmm. Um, in the rebuilding of the palace by uh, Sir Charles Barry and Augustus Welby, uh, Northmore Pudgeon, Brilliant name. Oh, <laughs> sorry, or what? It's either Pudgeon or Pugin. I don't know. It could be French. Oh, okay. Right, yeah. Um, he's an English architect, so I don't know how he would prefer to uh, pronounce it. Uh, the library was given four large rooms on the riverfront of the principal floor of the new palace, each 40 feet by 25 feet and some 20 feet high. This suite was fully opened uh, by 1852 and two additional rooms added in the mid to late 1850s. One of these was to compensate the loss of room D, which was taken over by Speaker Denison and his successors as their private library. It was not restored until the 1960s. Well, I'm sorry. Did some members of parliament commandeer the parliament? So the, 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 the library. So, yeah. So John Evelyn Denison, first Viscount Ossington uh, PC, was a British statesman. He served as Speaker of the House of Commons from 1857 to 1872, uh, and he took over Room D uh, and his and all his successors as their private library. So that must be the private li- private library of the Speaker of the House. Oh, I see. It's not like they just commandeered the library and just like took all the books for their own personal use. Mm. Okay, that's a little bit less uh, intriguing. But, it okay, was stocked right. with some 30,000 books majoring in history, topography, literature, biography and politics, as well as the official papers of the House, almost uh, almost alone among contemporary parliamentary libraries. From about 1860 onwards, the staff were given free reign to determine the scope of the collection. So what, what kind of, is this a legal reference library? Like what, what's it mostly made of? The library today provides four core services to the House members and their staff. A confidential uh, inquiry service for members and their staff covering all subjects of parliamentary interest, some 19,200 uh, substantive request logged inquiries were received in just between 2010 and 2011. Nearly 20,000 requests. Wow. So, so I guess I guess this, m- this must be where they keep... Um, their copy of Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, things like, you know, <laughs> the really important stuff that we can't do without. Um Briefings for the House and members generally covering the business of the House and other issues of parliamentary concern. Mm-hmm. 83 uh, research papers around half on bills before the House and 187 debate packs were produced in 2010 2011. Library services including reading rooms, book loans, online resources and reference collections and training and guidance in the use of information, particularly online resources and library services. I bet you this was relevant recently because, do you remember um, Burko, uh, the Speaker of the House, John Burko, denied a third vote for Theresa May's deal on the precedent of a, of, uh, a previous ruling in 1604, I believe it was? So I bet hmm. you he went to this very library to dig that out. Like, this is, this is actually now a relevant... Yeah. Uh, you know that it has been used in recent days um, for the to the for the good, I would argue, of the country. Wow! Thing here, there's an int- so there's a list of all of those who have served as librarian to the of the House of Commons of the Library. Right. Goes back going back to 1818, as of 2015, and still currently, uh, it's Penny Young who's the current and 15th librarian. What a lovely name, Penny Young. That's yeah. a great name. Okay. So there's also a reference here. Although members of the House of Lords may by courtesy use the library, the House of Lords has a separate library, brackets, and equally fine set of rooms. Of course they have to specify. <laughs> just like, just so you know, it's, it's a really also nice. It's like, it's, imagine if it was like a property listing, because obviously I've been looking at houses recently. Uh, if it was like mm. a stunning library location uh, with, uh, how, how many volumes was it? Did it, did it say? 
or in the House of Commons library. Yeah, yeah. Because oh no, it was twenty thousand um, requests. I had that figure in my head. Yeah. Uh, the total uh, holdings are about three hundred and fifty thousand print items plus journals and official papers. So none of that's counted in the online. Okay, so a stunning central London location with over three hundred thousand entries may contain asbestos. Yeah. Um, we're asking for uh, five hundred thousand per month. The House of Lords Library looks like the Devon and Exeter Institution. Oh, what did we talked about? Um, that wasn't the episode, wasn't it? We didn't talk about it after the episode. I think so. If you stick okay. House of Lords Library into Google Images, um, the reading rooms look the same. <laughs> House of... I mean, to be fair, they're all libraries from about the same time, right? Yeah. Uh, House of Commons... Sorry, did you say House of Commons or House of Lords? House of Library. Lords. House of Lords Library. So, it's, hang on. I'll, I'll have a look at the, the picture of the House of Commons Library first. Okay. Now, let's just do a comparison, right? That looks an awful lot like a lot of Oxbridge College libraries. Wood panelling carpet, lots of desks with kind of leather chairs, and it just looks like it th- should be filled with smoke. The House of Commons Library, I think, looks much nicer than the House, House of Lords. House of Lords Library. Uh, yeah, I've got to agree with you. The House of Lords Library looks a bit more like the Oxford Union, which I'm sure is not a coincidence at all. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah, that, that, I definitely prefer the House of Commons one. Sorry, this is this is about as is this the most British episode we've ever had? We're just like, well, I think the House of Lords Library is actually inferior to the House of Commons. Bizarre, interesting, though. Is there anything else of note in this article? Well, let's have a look and see. Not really. <laughs> Okie dokie then. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't think that's really that's, that's it. Then we're done with the move. interesting bit of the podcast stuff. If you came here for the Wikipedia stuff, we're done. Oh, it has a website. Oh, right, good. We found more content, everyone. Don't leave yet. <laughs> www.parliament.uk forward slash commons library. Parliament. They have a YouTube UK channel. Slash commons library. No, it's the, just the UK. Yeah, uh, it's just the UK Parliament um, YouTube channel. How they how that they've got a video though, which is quite uh, interesting. How the House of Commons Library does something. Like the Parliament.uk. For one thing, I haven't seen a .uk um, domain name before. I don't think. Wow. What is it about public sector websites website domains that just, they're all just absolutely abysmal? They look like they're about 10 years out of date, which I suppose is because they are, because no one's paid for any money to have them redone. Yeah. Like, I, I was looking at um, Captain Reed, um, who's a, a, a you know, very active member of the community, who's now one of the, um, uh, the Ladmins on the Discord. His mm-hmm. website, infinitely better than this. I was yeah. very impressed by by his by the captain's um, website. Not Riley reads, but I just just want to be very clear: they are different people. Yes. Uh, we have conflicted and very them different before. Websites. Very different websites. Uh, captain reads uh, is um was, was I mean I I'm going to say it's ten times better than the Parliament website. That's not terribly impressive. Yeah. Um, but what I am trying to say is it was impressive. What I am looking at is on here. There is a section of the website called Hansard. Have you ever heard of Hansard before? No. What's that? Hey, I've never heard of this. Right, so I'll read from the wiki. Hansard is the traditional name of the transcripts of parliamentary debates in Britain and many Commonwealth countries. It's named after Thomas Curson Hansard, who from who was like late 18th century, a London printer and publisher who was the first official printer to the Parliament at Westminster. So it's the official transcripts named after the guy who originally printed them. Never heard of them before. That's actually quite kind of interesting. Uh, good grief. We found something to talk about in the House of Commons that wasn't Brexit related. And it's actually interesting. Oh, this is really cool. So on the website, hansard.parliament.uk, you can view the latest sitting of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. In text form. Yeah, and it gives you a breakdown of what's happened. Does it do you know everything that John Burko says in capital letters? Oh, oh that's annoying. So... um. So there's kind of like a contents page and you can you can click what's ever happening in within that section so that it opens with Commons Chamber, House of Commons, um, Wednesday, 27th of March, 2019. The House met at half past 11 o'clock. Half past 11 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Prayers. Mr. Speaker in the chair did the opening. Apparently there's opening prayers. There are opening um, prayers? Yeah. I had um, no idea. I mean, it's a good job they have to pray as well because we have to we have to do a parliamentary prayer after every even song, and we have done for the past well since September, I think. Since Is that just started. because of the Brexit? Uh, I think so, really. Yeah, just like we're just praying for an end to it, guys. Like even the even the cathedral's packed out with people. <laughs> Right, that's enough of the House of Commons Library. Um, and look, we spoke about that the whole time, and we didn't even talk about Brexit. Barely mentioned. <laughs>
<laughs> um, Hardly discussed at all. So something which which came up, um, which was a big surprise to me, uh, mm-hmm. was I don't know if you've seen this, but I appeared in a video on the, the Oxcast main channel. I didn't see that. No, when was this? So this was yesterday. So basically, what happened was I went to Bristol. Um, basically, some friends of mine got engaged, and they had like a um a surprise kind of party for it um which was really really fun love it to go back and I, as soon as i was in bristol i messaged lewis i was just like hey i'm in town um do you want me to come in and film anything because like normally i've been a part of civ streams with them before mm-hmm. uh and i was like well you know do you want me to we stream on mondays do, should i stay for another day and then i can come in he was like yeah sounds good um so i did a stream from like two till eight uh playing civ uh but what i did before that was they were like yeah we, we're playing some gta but we just had a dropout um do you want to come play GTA with us? <laughs> I was like, uh, well, I've never played before. I've never mm. played GTA on the computer. I've played a little bit of GTA 5 on a PS3. Um, yeah, sure. How badly can this go? Um, and But what I was expecting was that it was going to take them weeks to edit it. Because, you know, they're a big YouTube channel. They've got a lot of stuff on the go. I assume that their backlog was like quite a few days. But it came out on, what, Wednesday? So it came out two days after I recorded it. Um mm. And it was, it was, it's interesting to like, I always assumed that with these big YouTube channels that, um, with the gaming ones, that it was always, what happened in the recording session was always yeah. quite different from the final product. Like there was a lot of stuff that was cut out. There was a lot of talking over everybody. But what was quite surprising was that when you were actually playing, it felt exactly like a video in that they were, mm-hmm. actually the editing is relatively minimal but it's all the little things just to make things a bit more understandable and to yeah. shift audio the around changing to, of like yeah points of view and things and yeah and, and cutting out bits that just drag a little bit and maybe jokes that don't quite land but um it felt like exactly you know that the end result was almost exactly like my experience recording it which was quite surprising um but it was, uh, yeah, it was really, really fun. Uh, I would highly recommend recording videos with the Oxcast. Uh, for people get an opportunity to, they are a lovely group of people. Um, even if I do still suck at GTA, although I did, mm. I didn't DNF in at least one race, so that's something. Um, I'm just on the video now, and 15 hours ago, someone called Nikolai has commented saying, uh, "You sound like calf." Well, the thing is, though, I actually talked in the GTA video, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't, I can't sound that much like him. Um, but um, yeah, I have had that before. Somebody mentioned that on the stream um, that I sounded like Calf, but it's done quite well. Like the, the response seems to be good. The response on Reddit's nice because obviously, like when you're part of this, is a much bigger audience. Like this was going out to how many subs do they even have? I actually don't know. Um, well, the video itself has got nearly one hundred and fifty thousand views. Yeah, and like, it, and it gets sent out to. Hang on, I've just found their channel. Um, I mean, the Blue Zephos channel has seven point two million subs, so it's like it's quite a big audience to be exposed to all of a sudden. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so you know, you can't help but be a little bit like paranoid about what oh, are people going to like me? It's like going to school. It's going to school for the first time, and everyone's and you have all these anxieties about what if the kids are mean to me? What if I have people uh, in my class don't like me? What if I don't get along with people? As it turns out, everything was absolutely fine, uh, and I we spent a fair bit of time between one of the sessions um, whilst like maps were loading, talking about Harry Potter and forty k, uh, and I was like, I found my people. <laughs> this is this is this, this is where I was meant to be. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll include a link in the show notes uh, to people who are interested uh, in watching it. I think, it, I, I mean, I watched it back and I thought it was a funny episode. Um, yeah, I'll or, have to give it a watch. Yeah, no, it's it's. Um, we watched a bit of it on stream last night. Oh God, I streamed last night and we and it was such a weird one. We got through two questions from an A level paper in physics, and then we basically just watched a bit of this video because I wasn't expecting it to come out, and then we watched the Brexit votes come in uh, live. Oh, yeah, and I was just like, what is this stream? We come? found out. We did the vestry prayer, closing vestry prayers, walked back to take our cassocks off and someone said, oh, Theresa May said she'll resign. <laughs> and that was that was how I heard, uh, that's how we found out somebody's phone pinged. And, yeah, uh, it's the, um when you get a BBC News notification, it's like, oh, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? Uh, like, you know, because especially when there's times of like, you know, there's a debate happening or what, whatever. And you're like, what I've started doing is when there's a group of people, if I'm if I'm around like me, Pixel Girl or, or like, a you know, other group of people, just be like, right, what do you think? Let's take bets. What is that? <laughs> what is that news notification? Um, yeah. I don't think anyone's been able to successfully guess correctly because the situation is just such a... A clusterfork, uh, as you would say, mm. in the, the good place. Indeed. But, uh, oh, 
Good grief. Anyway, sorry. So yeah, that that was um that's just something to 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 bring up. Thing is, I don't think it fits terribly neatly into any other corners. That I am now uh, part of the Yogscast cinematic universe officially, which is the YCU. Oh, uh, oh, very good. I like I like what you did there. Um, cool. Well, s- shall we then? Seeing as you were just talking about it, we talk about your choral piece of the week. <laughs> And this will be my piece of the week. Drum roll, please. So I've given this one quite a bit of thought um, Mm -hmm. in that normally I kind of (laughs) wait till we get to do the podcast and I think, well, what's been my favourite piece this week? Uh, It's going to be this. Um, But I've known for a couple of days, in fact, since Monday, what this piece was going to be. um, Because uh, those of you who follow me on Twitter, Daniel J. Moore, or... um, Dan Moore on Instagram, you may have seen a video, a a brief uh, extract of Ah, uh, the the early music consort Ex Noctem, which is I'm one of the tenors. Uh, We did a piece by the hitherto unknown, certainly to me anyway, um, uh, Robert Ramsey. I have heard the name before. I I can't tell you any pieces off the top of my head. Scottish born, composer and organist, um, may have been... uh, he seems to have been, yeah, here we go. He seems to have been from a family of court musicians to King James the Sixth. Um, he graduated as a Bachelor of Music from uh, Cambridge, and he was organist at Trinity College, Cambridge, and Master of the Children until 1637. He's really, really cool, but he, he, he's written this anthem called How Are the Mighty Fallen, or How the Mighty Are Fallen. There's some discrepancy over which, it's, um, which it is. And it's this really excellent piece of... Um, polyphony at times with some kind of moments of kind of more homophonic texture it's because, similar to oh yeah go on because um you recorded this and you're performing it and the composer's dead by several centuries does that mean that we can actually just include the recording that you made in the podcast so you don't even have to describe it people can hear it yeah you can we can we can do a bit of that a bit of that clip i don't have the full recording because the whole piece goes on for about 12 minutes <laughs> but okay um, well <laughs> the, the brief did... clip uh, we can use i shall uh, we, we shall do some with some editing magic thank you adam uh, here's a here's a brief extract of uh, how are the mighty fallen Now, what did people hear in that extract, Dan? What were the things that you should that you'd like to draw attention to? Um, the bit that I, well, I'm have to try and remember which part of the piece we we recorded. <laughs> um, I think what I was going to say: Are you familiar with um, Tomkins' "When David Heard"? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the kind of the 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 melody in that across parts, you have these kind of um, rising, gradually kind of rising and subsiding lines that usually go from the lowest voice part to the highest voice part, and it's quite kind of um, lamentful mm. and uh, and 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 somber, um, but then also builds to these moments of real um, kind of tension and conflict, and uh, it's quite fraught. This piece does a very similar thing. Um, however, while it's, I would say it's less explicitly sad like when david heard um i think i'm going, I'm going to pull up the text to how are the mighty fallen because instead of oh absalom it's oh jonathan so how, did this piece come after when david tomkins uh yeah i think so tomkins was this is a rip-off this is a this is a freebooted thomas version tomkins. of when david heard <laughs> yeah thomas tomkins was born in 1572 and robert ramsey was born in 1590 so a similar time so it, it may well be that he actually did take inspiration from Tompkins then. That's interesting. Mm. Um, which And you can absolutely see that in, in the music. So the text is, How are the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in the high places. O Jonathan, woe is me for thee. O Jonathan, my brother Jonathan, very kind hast thou been to me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. 
How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war destroyed? So it's a very kind of... Lovely text. Yeah, it's really lovely. But you get these moments of... So as you can imagine, the musical setting of How are the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? Oh, Jonathan, thou was slain in the high places. That's very... There's a lot of kind of conflict written into the music. Um, mm. But then as you move into... Um, uh, very kind hast thou been to me. Thy love to me was wonderful. And in that clip um, that uh, the uh, the readers would have heard, there's this beautiful moment where the kind of um, the tonality and texture changes to this really glorious um, kind of sun shining through the clouds moment on the on the on wonderful. That's all built up through all these lines of polyphony to this one kind of unified moment of 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 wonderfulness. Um, and it's just really good. It was recommended to us by our our base, um, our first base, James Picton Turberville. Um, and uh, it's just brilliant. Do you remember, I think we spoke about, this would have been probably over a year ago now, we spoke to, spoke about William Billings. Yeah, Billy Billings. Yeah. Yeah, or Billy Billings. Well, I think... He thinks um, I see an Henley... Yeah, sorry. I yeah. just got carried away. <laughs> Um, this is going. This is this is a Billings esque discovery. Um, Top Billings, you might say. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, but yeah, Robert Ramsey, um, game changer. Fantastic. Well, so also Robert Ramsey's. Chef, I told you this would happen. Sorry, no. How the mighty have fallen. Yeah. Uh, is your piece of the how week. how the mighty have fallen or how are the mighty fallen? They, they kind of it, the the title differs. Um, Wow, that sounds very interesting. And I'm glad that we yeah. that's the first time that we've actually, you know, been able to show properly showcase the piece in the in the, in the episode because, you know, mm. you recorded it. So please do some more of these, uh, record some more interesting music so we can actually show people. Well, yeah, I'll try to. Orally. Orally show people. Orally, orally, orally. What would you like to criticize today, Daniel? Well, I'm just thinking I'm trying to think about what I've watched to be honest. The last today include and yesterday have been the kind of the last two days where I really had a kind of calmer time and not been thinking about oh I've got this due this due this due because I had my this week marks the end of formal teaching um, uh, that I'll actually have like ever as an oh as an of course undergraduate, yeah yeah because it'll be the end of which is quite odd um, as a result I haven't really seen a great deal I have been watching um, with gusto the new season of Gardener's World with Monty Don. That's been pretty excellent. How As do you result, watch Gardener's World with of... gusto? Like, can I just, how does, do you sit there sort of like rocking backwards and forwards on the chair? Like, oh, f- perennials. Well, I think <laughs> the thing I like, the thing I like about it is that it's very much up to you on how you'd like to react. Typically, as the, um, as, as the kind of, the, um, the pastoral strings strike up a melody, and Monty walks into the frame with his dog. I I just start screaming. And then when I when I've screamed myself hoarse, uh, I rewind and watch it again because obviously you can't hear. What you can do um, by skipping that step is just turn the subtitles on, um, and you don't need to to hear what you're saying for the beginning. And then by the time when you can't scream any anymore, you're you're all right. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. I just had the <laughs> ah! absolutely yeah. Sorry, Adam, you're going to enjoy that one, aren't you? Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, so... Oh, did you catch up on Umbrella Academy at all? No. Ah, you definitely... So I've finished that now. Pixel and I have finished it. I did... Um, i tell you what I did watch, though, which mm. I really loved and forgot how much I liked. Um, uh, Avengers Infinity War. Oh, oh, right. So you're watching this and uh, preempting, you know, to, to refresh yeah. before uh, Endgame. Did it hold up on a second viewing, then? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, obviously, it wasn't as kind of the ending wasn't as shocking because you kind of know what's going. You you kind of know what's happening. Um, yeah. It's not a teleological plot really, really the second I... time round. Well, no, no, it is. A, no, it is a teleological plot the second. It's every movie has a teleological plot the second time round. That's interesting. Sorry, go on. Yeah, um, it was just a, a kind of visual feast. You forget how brilliant the the kind of the the CG and. Yeah, everything about it really. Now, I, I really, I really liked it. It's interesting that you use the phrase "visual feast" because um, one of my favourite YouTubers, uh, who I think, is really perceptive is Patrick H. Willems. I don't know if you've watched mm-hmm. any of his stuff. Uh, who does video essays on on movies, and um, what distinguishes him is that he will, instead of just doing something like, for example, not to do, not to put down um, her content, but something like Lindsay Ellis, who does. Um, 
for the most part, she has actually started doing more of this recently, to be fair, just talking over clips of the films and maybe a little bit to camera. What Patrick does is actually include filmmaking techniques and sort of short movies almost in his video essays um so it, he it's kind of, it's quite a, a meta discussion of film themes sometimes and he's done a two-part um series that's about an hour of content in total um about the limitations of the mcu and specifically mm. he's he's had a, a bee in his bonnet for a long time about um how flat everything looks in marvel movies um and like how boring the cinematography is a lot of the time because i would agree wholeheartedly with you that the cg is amazing like the, the the way that they brought thanos to life is like he's undeniably like a character like he he's photorealistic um mm. but the cinematography in general with a few notable exceptions is really quite dull and boring um i think infinity war has been one of the exceptions to marvel's kind of um more recent back catalogue and when i say recent i mean like post 2005 where i thought infinity war made more of a concerted effort to emulate comic book style framing so if you think if you if you went to so you know like the think of the initial charge that the um that the avengers make when they're in um wakanda is it the Yeah. yeah 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 if you I, I remember kind of watching it, I rewound it and just periodically hit play, pause, play, pause. And you know how in comic books, how they... Um, Do splash pages. Vis- yeah, and, they, and yeah. you'll have moments of kind of like the, the framing will suddenly be completely different and uh, you can almost... It, it'll be kind of um, angled in such a way that it gives the image movement. You get just mm. as much movement in a frozen frame as you do when the image is moving because of should, the way that they ca- they've moved the camera. You absolutely should watch this this video series. It's, it's only two videos. Mm. I shouldn't really call it a series. It's a video in two parts about um, why he thinks, Patrick H. Williams thinks, that Joss Whedon was the best person to do that in the MCU. Like, mm-hmm. the, And the classic example is that shot in The Avengers of uh, this in the original Mm. avengers of you know the camera rotates around it's the whole group um like facing outwards and they're united um for the first time properly in the movie um and it's like that's that's in a way the most iconic shot of the whole mcu like the the Mm. way that that whedon seems to get it because he he you know he put a massive stamp on the mcu and yeah like um age of ultron is a bit of a mess but um Mm. you know it's still I don't know. I still think I prefer his style of things to the way that the Russo brothers have do those. For example, the, for example, the way they do those splash frames. Um, mm. Yeah, you should watch it. I'll, I'll include a link in the show notes to people. I think he's one of the best um, film YouTubers at the moment. Um, I'd highly, highly recommend the video series because it's you know he's th- he's has th- he's watched every single one and put a great deal of thought into this and like. I think it, it, in a way it is difficult to voice a dissenting opinion about Marvel. Mm. Um, it, it, everyone is so it kind of expected at this point to be a massive Marvel fanboy. And it, and it has also become very tribal with Marvel read DC. Like you're either in the Marvel cult or you're out of the Marvel cult. There's no gray area. Um, and I think like what he does very well is actually say, look, I like these things, but there are big problems with the way they do. For example, mm. their cinematography. Um yeah, I, I yeah, highly recommend it. That that's um okay. that's one. I was just looking through my liked videos, which is why I was reminded of that. Um As a brief uh, aside, Joss Whedon looks incredible for fifty four. Let's have a look. Joss Whedon. What does he look like at the moment? I have at, I does, have at least I saw him about ten years ago. If I looked at a picture of him, I would not say he looks fifty four. Now when are the Infinity War Yeah, he's looking pretty good there. He looks a bit like an alt Simon Lane. If Simon Lane had yeah, a smaller forehead, or Phil forehead. from EastEnders with a beard, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. That's one way of looking at it. Yeah, marvelous man. Look, look, at, look, look at him when he's younger, though, when he doesn't have a beard. But mm. Joss Whedon without a beard looks like a bit like David Cameron, actually. Oh my god, maybe we maybe we found the conspiracy theory. Jesus, I've gone too greedily and too deep. I need to mm. just get off of this. I don't want to see that. I don't want to have my boy sullied. Um, Belrog's coming for you. Or miked. Um, right, so d- d- basically, I haven't been watching very much recently because I've just been so busy. Um, I have been watching a lot of TNG. Um, I would like to put a plug in here for Red Letter Media. Have you watched their most recent Best of the Worst? 
I haven't, no. Oh, it's one of their best. I did, however, I... watch their Half in the Bag of Captain Marvel, is it? Oh, I saw Captain Marvel now. I have actually seen... I don't know if I... We, I don't think we talked about this, but I have seen Captain Marvel, and I completely agree with their analysis. It is yeah, so fair. mediocre as a film. That's a shame. Oh, it's... It felt like a cookie-cutter movie. Uh, of, I think more than any other Marvel movie I think I've seen. It was just like, it is a movie. It fulfills these requirements. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are some very impressive things in it. Like, for example, nobody seems to be talking about how incredible the anti-aging technology used on Samuel L. Jackson is. Like, he just doesn't look old. Mm. It's pretty flawless, really. Um, but in terms of a plot, it's just... ah, oh, Yeah. It's just not... It's not a good movie. It's not good. It's not bad, per se. It's just not a good movie. Um, and mm. also, yeah, Brie Larson is... Like, I, I didn't really notice it at the time, but because possibly I'm quite unimaginative in this sense, but I, she is definitely miscast. They definitely could have gone with someone a lot better for that role. But yeah, there we go. So yeah, uh, but, but what I wanted to just plug briefly was uh, Red Letter Media. Their um, Best of the Worst series is one, possibly my favourite series on YouTube. Um, mm. And the most recent one, it's an hour and 20 minutes long, but oh my God, is it worth it? It's so good. They're doing, um, for those, for very, very briefly, um, basically they watch terrible movies and they... Um, you know, they vote on which one they think was the best. And there's an extended discussion. And, and bear in mind, these are trash, like the room level movies. Um, but this one was a little bit different in that they did a battle of the genres. So they had, they watched one horror movie, one action movie and one sci-fi movie. And they had, they voted on which one they thought was the best representative of the genre. Um, and they're all crazy. They're all absolutely crazy movies. Um mm. So if it's a good introduction to, to to Red Letter Media for those of you who maybe haven't watched any before. Uh, yeah, that's that's my thing for Critics Corner. I've just been I've been reading and, and whatnot, but I've just mostly been working. I've been a busy boy. Very mm. busy boy. Well, shall we go over into corner that makes the powers the other corner? It's the mitochondria of the podcast, Dan. Powerhouse of the cell. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> So we're in Patreon corner, Simon. I can't help but notice that you've gone um, gone a little quiet. What are you doing? Well, I'm busy, Daniel. I'm I'm do- I'm changing the Patreon. I'm doing it. We've been talking oh about God. it for weeks, but we get there are no more top lads. There are Is no it? more top lads, They're Daniel. Gone. They're gone. What we're now going to have is top cat and top dog, because right. I'm sick and tired of the tyranny of top of Team Dog lording over Team Cat and the one dollar per month at patreon.com forward slash the wikicast. Um, we never forget. Sorry, we always forget to actually say the URL. Um, but I'm convinced that all the people in Top Lad are actually cat supporters, but they're, they're too nice to us and they want to give us five dollars a month rather than a dollar a month to support the podcast and everything we do. Where does their money go again, Dan? Well, their money does many things, Simon. One, for one, it, it pays for our hosting, which is incredibly important, without which uh, this podcast couldn't function. Equally, uh, it also funds a, uh, a donation to the Wikimedia Foundation, again, without whose help uh, we'd be, uh, well, we'd be buggered, really. Um, well, no one would also, get a degree ever again. It also funds the uh, the Wikicast Animation Scholarship Fund. Um, yes. Which uh, which is less of a scholarship fund and more of a more of a cash prize for any <laughs> any kind of budding animators out there uh, who are taking part in the wikicast animation contest which we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now very exciting um mm. do get but, your entries uh, in people i'm really excited to see some okay so i've just created the two tiers for top cat and top dog those of you who were team lads i'm not going to assume that you're all top cat people though really i was very tempted to just rename that to top cat, top lads, top cat, um, and then you know, <laughs> guarantee, uh, guarantee that I was going to win next week. Um, top lads gone. The wiki cast is now massively unprofitable. Um, oh my gosh! Right, there are now team cat and team team dog uh, tiers, uh, and there we go. They're, they're now they're now on on the they should now be visible because patrons had a redesign which we were just b-ing about off camera. Uh, there were, well everything we do in this show is off camera because you know we we don't have cameras. Um, there we go. Uh, but right, so if you're a top lad now, you're going to need to put in your vote for um, whether you are a, a team cat or a team dog supporter. Um, mm-hmm. So if I go on the page now, it should be should all be updated. There we go. Live editing happening in the Wikicast several wow. days after it happens. Um, so appearing behind the curtain. <laughs> God, it's like being in the Wizard of Oz. Um, mm. 
so there we go. If you're a top lad, we're not we're not going to read any because uh, we've now deleted the tier. So we the, we have just said or I've just said in the um the team cat and, uh, top cat and top dog tiers um that your name will be read out in each episode of the show. We will be reading out our respective teams. So mm-hmm. um you know that the, the for starting from next week that'll be the case. But obviously those tiers are empty yeah. and team and top lad doesn't exist anymore. So it's quite a short relatively short top lad section. Uh but you know, as Dan says the Patreon makes this show possible because we don't do ads. Um this pays for Adam being able to edit the podcast for us. It pays for the hosting. It pays for the uh, us being able to do contests like the animation contest. It's pretty fundamental to the existence of the show is what I'm saying. So mm. for those of you who are willing to support us, even if it's just a dollar a month, make a massive, massive difference. So thank you very much. Now, I wonder, before we jump on in into Crisis and Correspondence, given that we've been on Patreons and we're, and we're, we're looking towards our, our wonderful readers cast your mind back a couple of weeks uh, and you may remember that we discussed a music survey yes do you you recall this the track record i'm making a big deal about this because i don't want it to just to kind of breeze under the radar as a thing that i did because it took ages (laughs) (laughs) it was i've mad so the most okay. There were two things that made this process incredibly frustrating. One, there wasn't really a set um, format of how people should uh, send in their their kind of um, their answers to this survey. If I had a unified format, it would have meant considerably less kind of research on my part. Also, I realised what I could have done to speed up this process way more was just make like a Google Doc, and people oh, yeah. could have filled it in. Piece of cake. But no, I didn't think. About, I didn't think this through at all. So I've learned lots of things in this process. However, we've had quite frankly a staggering amount of emails. I think the most emails we've like ever had for any kind of piece of correspondence. Um, they're still coming in to this day. Um, so I'm gradually adding to this um, this document, this Excel. God, I'm, I'm even in Excel. This is how exciting we're getting. <laughs> um, but but what I've done so far is I took each of uh, your answers to these questions so that was your favorite song your most played song and your most recent song i've popped them into a table now this is where things took ages because people might not explicitly label each choice as favorite most played most recent in that order i then had to kind of write out each one <laughs> oh no you had the to order read the emails oh no <laughs> well no i had to read them but if they, if they had been in a kind of like in a set format i could have just copy and pasted each one as i read them into a table rather than having to f- format the table at the same time i yeah. then also failed because what i wanted to do was be able to kind of do a breakdown of who listens to what um it, like which genre is most popular are there certain artists that are you know most interested um the genre one was what i was most interested in so i then had to take every single song so that's three songs per person and i think this this table i've got has 35 people in it so what's three times 35 simon 105 yeah so that was 105 separate google searches to f- try and hone and 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 it glean. sounds it sounds like a, a great deal of work daniel we we appreciate your efforts immensely genres oh man anyway but i can now say we can now officially announce it's that there is a lovely sexy looking pie chart and i love a pie chart we shall put it in um, of, the on the Patreon and in the and yeah. in the Discord after this goes out. They will be uh, they'll be uploaded imminently. Um, I'm not going to upload the table because that has um, names next to choices and things. Um, yeah. So actually, what I'll do is I'll just hide the names and, and put the list anyway. I'm also going to try and create a um, a Spotify playlist and Apple Music playlist. Ah. And maybe YouTube one, if I can be bothered, that will be publicly available. So should you be going on a journey somewhere and you want to be able to shuffle through a random playlist comprised of music that the readership listened to. Mm. And it's safe to say this is a it's a massive <laughs> scope of music. For I'm instance, noticing that some someone's most played song is Africa by Toto. Which... Well, at least four people have chosen uh, Toto's Africa, which I think is brilliant. <laughs> um, but for instance, we have um, uh, The Doppelganger by Schubert as the most played Piece, which is a classical, a classical piece. Mm-hmm. Um, the next entry, as most played, was a, B, a piece called BTS Cipher Four, which is a piece of K-pop. Um, okay. We then jump to some metal, then some indie, a bit of pop, some rap, some folk, 
and then Lana Del Rey. Uh, who is, in a, of course, a genre on her own. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Um, so, so what are the, your conclusions? Uh, the pie chart what, I've created. What, 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 what are the headline conclusions? As expected, um, the most sizable chunk of pie on 28% uh, falls under the category of rock. Now, rock is a... <laughs> Pretty broad, pretty broad, uh, pretty broad genre. Yeah. Um, that's followed closely by pop at 18%. Then interestingly, indie music and classical music are tied at 10% apiece. I'm surprised that we didn't have more classical music, actually, considering yeah. the, the demographics of the readership. Um, we have, uh, oh, I think a couple of people had um, their favourite pieces were, they had two different bar chorales, which I think is marvellous. Excellent choices. If you were, if you can remember that you were one of those people, then congratulations. Um, metal comes in at nine percent. Uh, then we have folk at seven. Uh, so it is quite rap. disperse. Yeah. yeah, rap at six. Um, R and B at four. And then the the kind of the remainder six percent falls under the category of other because it might just be a genre that's so incredibly niche it doesn't actually have its own name. Although I did, I, there was a new um, a new genre I hadn't heard of before called bossa nova. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like so the um uh, the piece of music the, what people call the Austin Powers music is soul bossa nova. Yeah, like that's uh, that's what, um, that's what and it's so bossa nova comes sap come like slash samba. Um, was yeah. was one of the choices, and I've I've listened to they, as I went through and was was looking up these uh, these various bands, uh, to, but well, bands that I didn't know. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there's some really cool stuff. So you've all got really interesting music tastes, and I like it very much. So the basically the headline conclusions here are that um, the Wikicast readership has diverse music tastes, but the most popular genre is rock, followed by pop. Yeah. So basically similar to the rest of the population, yeah. <laughs> which I suppose... Well, I have noticed, by the way, so Dan has emailed me uh, a PDF of the music survey. The first... Oh, I know what you're going to say. The first... <laughs> yeah, is he talking about the other pages? Yeah, the first page is the Wikicast... Uh, <laughs> is the Wikicast uh, uh, track record. Yeah. All the other pages, what are this? So they are the they are just like preset when you choose to when you choose to create a, a spreadsheet in uh, numbers I think it is um, it gives you like a, a theme as kind of like this is like a sample thing and I just didn't delete the sample page so you've got these other ones which will be there are eight sample pages of like uh, explaining uh, fundraiser results by salesperson um, yeah. an area chart of uh, different product sales in different years um, yeah. Temperature and rainfall for a particular location. This looks like it's probably California or something. Like, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I find this very interesting compared to a uh, compared to the Wikicast uh, track record. This is much more. Well, there you go. It's it's a win-win. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for emailing in your um, your music uh, listen, listening tastes. I think that that is interesting. Obviously, you know, if you can make that spread that playlist. Um, well, which yeah. one are you going to go yeah, for? Sure people's favourite or people's most played songs? I might just do a general a big one of everything because then I think in terms of what you might get when you shuffle, you'll get such a broad range of stuff. So the the playlist will comprise of people's favourites, people's most played and people's most recent. Mm. Okay, so it's going to be a snapshot of what people are yeah. listening to. It's oh, been a really cool. interesting... It's genuinely been really, really interesting. And while it did take an absolutely... <laughs> age uh, i've learned many things along the way namely if i'm ever going to do anything like this again i'm making a google doc and having some uniform process um because yes. my god i was going spare at the end of it i think i was sitting i think i sat at my laptop for about two hours going through slowly tabbing across and oh man it was well it was a joy though an absolute joy we live we learn um we now know better we do but th- thank you for doing your work and thank you readers for entertaining us with your musical choices Top lad. So this week in Crisis Corner, we have possibly the first time ever in the Wikicast a three weeker. So bear in mind that we had two episodes ago. Um, a reader was writing in uh, called anonymous, of course, as all of all of our crisis res- uh, correspondents are, um, basically saying that they're not sure whether they want to do the PhD. Um, at their current university. They don't really want to do it there, but they feel like their supervisor isn't going to support them 
moving somewhere else. Um, and I gave my two cents at the time. We had a, another anonymous, anonymous, last week who gave their two cents on it. This week, we have two more emails, which I'm going to paraphrase because they've clearly put, pe- the readers have clearly put a lot of thought into this. Um, and it's good to get these different perspectives. And it's also interesting to see how many people have been doing PhDs in the readership. Um, but mm. yeah, because this is the third week, we will keep this relatively brief. Um, so thank you to Anonymous and Anonymous who emailed in. Oh, sorry, no. Um, this first one actually comes from a non hippo. <laughs> I, I like this trend of a nonny large mammal. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's very good. Um, so uh, what a, a nonny hippo is saying is a slightly different perspective. Um, to set the scene, slightly older than the readership, twenty six years old, and owns a house and married and an analyst in the public sector. Uh-huh. Um, and basically, uh, Anonna Hippo is saying there are a few key things left out of PhD discussions and a few red flags I hear that people who are a bit younger than me or haven't seen life on the other side may not consider. Firstly, people talk about not picking a PhD topic you're bored with. When I considered the best piece of advice I got to be, um, this will be the only time in your life you have three or four years to purely devote yourself to a single piece of work, make the most of it. Not necessarily wholly different from don't pick something boring, but probably a healthier way to look at it. So, you know, look at it in a case of a privilege to be able to study that particular thing. Uh, secondly, the person who asked the question um, said they wanted to pick, uh, this is the original anonymous, um, said they wanted to pick a PhD in their family and girlfriend. This always slightly concerns an on a hippo when people are looking at their academia. By definition, you're going to be moving around an awful lot during your career. And if being close to your family is important, then academia may not be for you. I think a very valid point. If you are thinking of going into academia, postdoctoral positions after you do your PhD you will move around every couple of months it's not a fun life it's one of the reasons I didn't do it um so yeah if you are thinking of not going into academia after the PhD uh then which you know makes me question is a PhD really right for you um then Mm -hmm. not really a problem but very good point um and then thirdly um you often talk about how shitty phds are for those doing them but if your reader is considering a family and has a long-term girlfriend it's worth considering a decision as a couple you don't Mm. go through a phd on your own and many people have to give a lot of time and energy to support you in what can be a fairly all-consuming endeavor if buying a house in the next few years is important then a phd will not be a route for you consider the opportunity cost so it's not sorry consider the opportunity cost in the context of your relationship and what your partner wants to do I am sure that Pixel Girl will agree with this, that supporting someone doing a PhD is a lot of work. Um, mm. It's not easy, not just for the person doing the research, but for the people in your life. It's not It's not easy, yeah. Uh, and then finally, last point, I think everyone, including the initial questioner, should make sure they consider other careers. I hear so many people who are interested in analysis and numbers and creating impact who say their solution is to do a PhD. For some people, this is true, but for a vast majority of people, you may well be able to do a lot more impactful research working for public sector and third sector organizations and even shudder in the private sector. Um, you will earn significantly more than you would doing a PhD and in some cases you would be doing a post, uh, and in some cases than you would be doing a postdoc um so very good advice there overall i think you know it is worth considering the other options and phd isn't the only way to be doing research and to be having impact by doing something analytical um Mm -hmm. and yeah i particularly do like the point uh, and i think it's a very good point about um the opportunity cost in your relationship because i think that's very true Uh, and then uh secondly we had an email from uh anonymous music (laughs) nice <laughs> amazing um who adds also same phrase uh they're two quick cents first of all anonymous music agrees with the general advice given by dan and simon follow the passion even amongst uh anonymous music's own phd co- cohort just under six months in they can notice the difference between people who are really passionate about their research and those who are already flagging uh don't cruise screw yourself over and tie yourself to a field that you're not passionate about do something that you can potentially imagine spending an entire career doing Absolutely. Um, turning down your supervisor's offer will, of course, be awkward. Doesn't need to be a total washout, though. Showing interest in continuing work on co-authoring a paper will keep you in the supervisor's good books and ultimately stand you in good stead for all future applications. Also, take this opportunity to ask your current supervisor's advice about networking and potential opportunities. I'm sure if you show that your relationship with your current supervisor is still important and valid, hopefully they won't leave you by the wayside. Again, very field dependent but i do think the idea about co-authoring a paper uh, it's like a good olive branch um Mm. that's that's a very good idea um and lastly in the end your supervisor would have to be very unreasonable not to understand your research interests ultimately lie elsewhere it's not quite the same but one of the people i applied to work with at a different uni to where the anonymous music currently is uh was very disappointed when i didn't get phd funding to work with her but was very supportive of going somewhere else when i was offered a full scholarship these kinds of conversations happen quite often in academia hopefully your supervisor will be understanding best of luck in your phd journey anonymous music 
Well, yeah, I think all 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 very wise, sage, uh, very conscientious as yeah. a as a as a fandom. It's got to be said. I do dearly love the readership. You're wonderful people. Mm. Right, let's go over to correspondence corner. All right. So we have our first email here from Jessica. It's titled PhD Application. Uh, She says, Hi, Simon and Dan. I emailed in a few months ago with recommendations on books about women's history in response to, oh yeah, episode Uh, uh, 42, Women's Liberation Movement in Europe. In that email, I mentioned that I was in the process of applying to do a PhD in history and I was really nervous about my chances. Since then, I've fortunately been accepted to a PhD program. Congratulations. Well done. In the fall, I'll be studying European women's history in the medieval and early modern periods. So excited. Uh, Is there any advice you could both give about doing a PhD and adjusting to life in a new city? Um, I imagine we can answer those, but uh, each one uh, in that order, respectively. Um, I'll have to move to another city when I start at this new university. I commuted to university during the entirety of my undergrad, so this will be a new experience for me. I'm nervous, but very excited to do this PhD, and I'm ready for the change. Keep up uh, the awesome work. Love the podcast. Thanks, Jessica. Um, well, what about moving to a new city? I've just been talking for ages. So yeah. What's your advice? Um, I think we've probably we've probably exhausted PhD advice. <laughs> um, I would say in a new city, uh, I suppose it, we don't say in terms of whether we're moving from a city like Exeter to a city like New York in terms of, you know, a big city to a, a relatively small one. Um, I think you're going to be meeting lots of people on your PhD anyway. So that's going to hopefully make things slightly easier. But don't limit your um, social sphere to just through who you're meeting through kind of academia find other outlets that are completely different and have absolutely no relation to your academic side at all so you've got something to kind of when you want to ease off a bit and and and, and properly relax you can really step away keeping that kind of work life balance i think is really important yeah 100% um, agree yes um so uh yeah see this might be a really a good opportunity to um check in with the uh check in with the readership and see if there are any fellow Wikicast readers where you're going, you never know. Stranger things have happened on this podcast where we've realised that we've got uh, we've got we've made connections uh, with people. Yeah, from it's not otherwise not, disparate uh, locations. Not impossible, I think. Uh, no. Yeah, it's, it's uh, we it, that'd be amazing. If and if you do do a meetup, do email us with a picture because we'd love to see it. Um, so what I would just say about starting a PhD is start at a pace that you can maintain. Don't sprint. Bear in mind that it is a marathon. It is a very long piece of work that you're about to start doing. Um, And so you should, you know, obviously you want to impress people when you start, you know, want to impress your supervisor and you absolutely should work hard. But make sure that you are starting to work at a pace that is feasible for you to maintain. Um, And exactly as Dan said, find an extracurricular, find something that you can, you can, uh, spend your time doing this not work it's just so important for your mental health um, and you know mm. this is going to be a difficult time it is a difficult time for everyone sooner or later you will come across a point in your PhD where it is just like feels like rock bottom it just feels so incredibly tough and having a support network outside of academia I think is super important to get through that situation um, but yeah pace yourself and be kind Absolutely. to yourself it's probably the best advice I can give we have another email here from Lauren titled University Help Brackets. Uh, seriously, please help. So uh, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. It sounds urgent. Um, she says, Hi, Simon and Dan. I'm having loads of trouble deciding between Durham and York for natural sciences. Uh, they've both given me the same offer and I love both universities. I know they're so different, but I can see myself being happy at both. What's your take? Thanks, Lauren. I have never been to Durham. However, I have been to York um, as I've got family there uh, and friends at the uni. Um, I think York is quite a bit bigger than Durham, is it not? Um, I, I, no, I'm in the opposite situation. I, I mean, I've been to Durham University. I've never been to York University. <laughs> um, I went to York when I was a kid, but that was way too long ago. I mean, so I think Durham is a collegiate university. It is, said, yeah. Well, it is, yeah. Whereas like York, I think is a pseudo collegiate university. I had a friend who went to uni there and he was saying that they were kind of like, kind of trying to do an oxbridge thing but not really like mm. the, so i guess it kind of depends on the structure you want i think really uh, uh, the, the the college structure makes a massive change like it makes a massive difference to your university experience um if you think you'd be better off in a smaller more contained educational environment i mm-hmm. think per- i mean personally i think that that would be most people um would benefit from it um mm-hmm. then i go for durham york i think is a bit more of a 
a bigger university, everyone's in a bit more of a melting pot. Although, yeah, there does seem to be some kind of college system going on. I would definitely welcome any input from people from York specifically, because I do know a bit about Durham, but from both of these universities, if we can get some feedback in next episode from people, yeah. that'd be incredibly useful. Also, I think the most um, important thing to do maybe in this situation, if the offer is the same and the degree is the same, really dive deep into what else is available to you at the university so if you've got a real passion for a certain extracurricular see which one caters to that more maybe have a look and see what the reputation of the student guild or union is like um what does the city have to offer is there more to do in york than durham um do you have family nearer by one or the other that might mean that you might want to be closer to them or indeed maybe further away also i'd, I'd say post in the discord if you are on the discord lauren mm. um, just post and say hey i'm i'm the the reader who's trying to you know, choose between York and Durham help. Um, there yeah. will be people, I'm sure, in the Discord who can who have experiences who can, if they don't go there, like had a look around the university recently and can sort of tell you a bit more about it. Um, yeah. The most important thing, go with your gut, I'd yeah. say. Um, absolutely just go w- with where you think you can be at home. And the, the best way of knowing that is what your heart, listen to your heart rather than your head, I think, at the end yeah. of the day. That's the most important I think also, um, don't worry about, uh, whenever I, you know, I've got, my younger brothers are currently looking at, at various places to go because they'll be coming to the end of their A-levels. And I know they've got friends who are stressing about making a choice, but they haven't got time to go and visit the uni or go and have a look around the city or whatever. When I was apply- applying for my um, universities, I wasn't even in the country. Like I, I never went to Exeter before. I, you know, of all, the, of all the unis I applied to, Exeter was the only one I didn't visit and ended up being the one I went to because it just felt like the one I'd be happiest in. And uh, so don't worry about those things about me. Like, oh, you know, I've, I've, I've been, I've visited Durham, but I haven't visited York. So I should probably go to Durham because I don't want to take the risk. Don't worry about it. You know, the UK is quite a big place and there's universities absolutely everywhere. It's you're making yourself, your life harder. If you try and expect yourself to visit every single place that you want to try and go to. So they um also it's it's worth pointing out they're both great universities they're both very well ranked very well respected universities yeah. so whichever one you end up going to you'll be okay don't worry absolutely then lastly this week we um we do have plenty more correspondence but we're just going to just going to wrap this off with yet more of my favorite poet it's my favorite poet dan it's riley reed um, oh, here we go. We've got we've got some yet more fantastic poetry that slew me last time. Um, so I haven't read these yet. This is going to be a, a live. I've I've read through some of these ones and they are excellent. Okay, so here we go. Um, uh, Riley writes, "Lordy pants, hopefully I haven't bitten off more than I can chew. Most of these poems were born from one morning shower. Enjoy, <laughs> lovely. Here we go. Roses are red. This room is lit dimly. It's been a while since we've heard from our dear friend Welsh Gimli." <laughs> Here we go. Nobody settle tosses in. a dwarf. Strap on. Oh, settle in, strap on, Riley. Um, roses are red. I just missed them. I guess I'll take the next train. All aboard the nasal feudal system. <laughs> roses are red. Stella. Bugs go through ecdesis. Send in your responses, everyone. We've got a reader in Croesus. <laughs> Strong. Oh, boy. Football game. Free admission. Tecmo Super Bowl special edition. Special edition. <laughs> this is the most it's circle, isn't it? the most circle jerky way we could end out the podcast. It's like here's a bunch of in jokes from pe- things that happened ages ago. Like mm. if you're new, you're not going to have a clue why these are funny, but they are to us. So f- you. Um, if you are new, incidentally, these um this this is t- roses are red to electric boogaloo. Um, each of these uh, limericks, I guess limericks. Uh. What are they? No, that's uh, not right. No, it's not it? a limerick. It's a. It's just two rhyming couplets, isn't it? Roses are red, violets is, is an example of what kind of poet? Hang on. Um, basically, the, either way, the rhyme is taken from um, previous episode titles that we've done before. So if you haven't listened to our Welsh back catalogue or catalogue or different, um, uh, uh, I've both said I've managed to say both catalogue and oh god. I think I'm having a stroke. Simon, you take you take over. Okay, quickly. Um, Simon and Dan on Patreon, they're dependent, so they thank their top lads, Connor Levers, Ben McMurtry, and Bendant. I like that. I, I like the fact also on my Patreon, Bendant has changed his name, so there isn't a gap. It is just Bendant. Um, it's just one word. Uh, okay, roses are red. Don't ask me twice. Dan's body really is just a human suit full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> Strong. I think this next one is one of my favourites. 
<laughs> Big Ben, Hyde Park, Dan Moore, Simon Clark. Yeah. Or is that meant to be Big Ben, Hyde Park, Dan Moore, Simon Clark? Simon Clark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big Ben, Hyde Park, Dan Moore, <laughs> Simon Clark. We've got a football chant, everyone. If we if there's a Wikicast football tournament for some unknown reason, uh, that's what they'll be chanting. Roses are red. What are you up to, Dan? Oh, nothing really. Just something that would please a 65 year old man. <laughs> They're literally talking about gardeners well this episode. It's very true. This next one is also hilarious. They'll leave the EU, but they'll still be in NATO. You can be the hurricane and I'll be the tornado. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? That sounds like a really good verse from like a punk rock band. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be, the song is called I'll Be The Tornado. And that's like the lead into the chorus. And I'll, I'll be, the be the tornado. The tornado. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Roses are red. Dan is a tease. And this will be my choral piece of the week. Drum roll, please. <laughs> yeah, nice. Roses are red. My rhymes are sub average. List of highways number 221 with special guest Alex Lambridge. Alex Lambridge. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh my god. Uh, DVD, CD ROM, Spongy Electric at gmail.com. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh boy! Uh, thank God that we didn't. We, you know, we eventually corrected ourselves from the. Uh, mm. Do you remember how we spent about the first ten episodes of this podcast telling everyone the wrong email address? Yeah, yeah. Thank God we got that sorted out. Roses Plus. are red. I know Gary S. May. Well, Simon, what have we learned today? That's a kids' nice. TV one. I like that. I like that a lot. And then finally, this. I like that this has gone in vaguely the chronological order of the episode because the final mm-hmm. one is, roses are red. Loving cats is a crime. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole, and we'll see you next time. And we'll see you next time. Oh, Riley, you've done yourself. Some of your, some of, as a connoisseur of your work, as is known, as some of yeah. your finest work. Um, outstanding. Are you a scarecrow? Because you're outstanding in your field. Brilliant. All right, all right, all right. So, Dan, what have we learned today? Well, Simon... We, we learned about the House of Commons Library and, and kept our discussion of Brexit to an absolute minimum, which I think is very cool. Established in 1818. Uh, and then we also learned about the burning of Parliament in 1834 because of our just stupid way of storing those... Um, <laughs> was it was getting, it? getting rid of the voting sticks. Yeah, it was small wooden tally sticks. That's, that also sounds like a game that you'd have played at like a private school. Come on, let's <laughs> for a, who's for a quick game of small wooden tally sticks? <laughs> oh, come on then, sir. <laughs> And then we also learned about Hansard, the um, uh, mm. official name of the transcripts, which is completely new to both of us. Um, and we, we had about- a discussion of, um, we had my choral piece of the week for, uh, from yes. the legend um, Robert Ramsey, um, yep. How the Mighty Have Fallen. Talked a bit about the MCU. I'd be very interested to see people's opinions. If people watch the um, Patrick H. Willems video, I would, um, uh, especially if it's he's new to you, I'd, yeah, go and watch his stuff. I think it's really, really good. Yeah. We also had the um, the Reformation if we had the the Patreon Reformation this week, yes, we did. Um, going to the, the this marks a of- move into. I feel like much like the the BC AD move. <laughs> we now have we now have a, something equally as uh, as important. I nailed my theses to the wall, um, which mm. was quite difficult because they're quite loose. Um, and we've <laughs> reformed the church, and yeah, there are no top lads anymore. Uh, and then yeah. following that, we had some cracking correspondence, including that amazing poetry. I, j- I just. I love that. I absolutely love it. Stella. That's all for this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcasting service of choice. You can like us on Facebook, and if you'd like to see our faces, check out our YouTube channel, Spongy and Electric. More music survey requests, Durham versus York, and other thoughts on the show can be sent to us at spongyelectric at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Roses are red. Loving cats is a crime. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole, and and we'll we'll see see you next time. time.